Hi guys, it is a yet another stormy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the great state of Texas going on. I think it might be officially the last day of winter 2020 and this is Sam Mitchell and you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles but this week as you're probably aware by now we're doing a special feature called Coronavirus Chronicles, where we are, where I am interviewing, I think, 22 people from across the collapse spectrum for their input uh, on the effects of coronavirus on global industrial civilization. And it is finally time to hear from, uh, from a relative youngster. I think everyone I have spoken to so far has been at least 60 years old. I hope I didn't just insult somebody, uh, one or two of you, but uh, we're bringing back on the show, I am thrilled to have back on this young man. Uh, we're gonna go over to Portugal and we're going to talk to, he calls himself a student of overpopulation issues and sustainability. And I'm gonna try to get through this name one more time, Joao. Abigail. And so, Joao, come on and say hi to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this 20 minute or so conversation. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Sam, for having me back. Okay, so as I'm sure is the uh, state in Portugal, as everywhere else, there is one story on this planet, and that is the coronavirus. So, we're going to go through these eight questions and get the Portuguese uh, experience of Corona. We're going all over the planet this week. So we're going to start off with your essay question and then we're going to break this down uh, a little bit more. <clears throat> so in your opinion, Joao, is the coronavirus, could it be the trigger for the collapse of global industrial civilization and why or why not? So I, I don't think, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's important to state that at this point we are just discussing impressions, not facts, as the papers will come out in the coming uh, months and probably years uh, about the coronavirus. But on my, on my perspective, I don't think it will be uh, the, the trigger for this, the collapse of civilization, but it will be a very big disruptor. Uh, which means that we, we have a chance here to try and reboot some part of the system as that is, they, those are the, the main discussions right now around the coronavirus and its impacts. Define your term really big disruption. So we are seeing the, the economic system falter and we'll probably see a, a recession in the, in the coming weeks because we have just for the last month, at least in Portugal, we have been in uh, self-quarantine for the last two weeks. Uh, we have started the, the emergency protocol just last night uh, by the command of the president. So I have been in quarantine, self-quarantine for two weeks now. And uh, I understand in this point that uh, we are just using the top of, uh, of resources that we have managed to, to gather. Uh, in, uh, in supermarkets, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, companies. At, at some point, for example, Portugal only produces about 15% uh, of the food for its population. So we are utterly dependent on the United uh, European Union uh, at this moment. So if the, this situation of disruption continues for a long time and if borders close, we will lose the, uh, that autonomy. Um, and that will be a very big problem if you're not a farmer, if you don't have the, the subsistence uh, means. So we have a, a disruption in the way that people are living their lives in companies, small, medium companies that are closing, that need injection of capital. Um, so that in itself, people being at home, not feeling well with uh, social distancing, that is a, a very big disruption for the, the way of life that we have gotten used to it. So what do you mean by an emergency protocol and starting last night in Portugal? What does that translate to? 
so uh, we are still delineating that. It will be it will come uh, it will be more clear in a couple of hours. So our president is is now with the uh, with the government, and they are in, uh, they are having reunions uh, online. And uh, we are still trying to figure out what that means, but it will probably not go into a mandatory curfew. But uh, we are seeing now that you can only leave your house to go and shop uh, for the essentials, uh, exercise only with someone that is in your house. So we, you can go in pairs, I think. You can go out and, uh, uh, with your dog, uh, for example. So it's really putting people in a, a, a quarantine. Until this point, it was a, um, a voluntary protocol. And uh, from, from today forward, I think it will be mandatory. But we are still delineating those points. Yeah, you're hearing this more and more uh, all, all over the the uh, country. So as long long as we're we're talking about this, uh, <clears throat> let, let let me jump ahead a couple of uh, of questions, and then we'll then we'll backtrack. So, do you think the reaction that you just described, what's going on in Portugal, and I know it's been going on for since Sunday next door to you in Spain and yeah. probably starting in Austin, Texas. Do you think the response by, the official response by government is, do you think it's overblown? Do you think it's not enough? Or do you think that it's about right doing what you can expect government to do for something like this? Uh, so I think that the, the government and the, the country started too late. And uh, we should have just um, initiated a, a global trying to keep the virus from exiting China. That should have been the the main the main activity back in January. Uh, now in March, we are seeing the, the the virus as a pandemic. We we can see that all of the the governments and countries are always a step behind, basically. And we see many differences. For example, in the UK, they had a totally different plan from uh, ours in Portugal. My university, for example, was one of the first to close uh, doors already almost two weeks ago. Uh, so as soon as we had one infected and reported case in Portugal in one university, almost all universities uh, uh, went ahead and closed doors. But the governments were always uh, a step behind, and I think they're trying to make it up now. And, but the the people the people in general they took a long time to wake up to this reality because last week a, a lot of people uh, were at home, but we had a sudden spike in temperature, so we reached like 27. And in Portugal, that's that's always a, a bad omen because everyone goes into the beaches. And we were in a, a, a situation that it's like a calm before the storm. We had about 20 cases in Portugal. Everyone went to the beach. Two days next, we had about 200 uh, cases. So this is where the, um, the problem uh, was. People were, were talking about self-quarantine, self-isolation. And a lot of uh, youngsters and schools were closing. People were just went out uh, and they didn't catch up the, um, the gravity of the situation soon enough. So, so government lockdowns and that stuff, you're, you're, you're okay with, you, you think uh, that the, the level of this threat is, does require such a, uh, such a, he such a heavy response, you're, you're okay with it. I think that is the, the role of governments actually, because we, um, individuals singularly cannot do what, what we require to do to keep a pandemic from spreading. So governments are required to act on our behalf and uh, curtail some of our freedoms and, uh, and liberties. And we, we cannot do that alone. Most, most people took a long time to understand that. But the, the interesting part is now uh, is that for the last week or so, since cases exploded in Portugal, it has been the public demanding the government to enact the state of emergency. They have uh, circulated petitions with uh, hundreds, uh, about a million signatures. In Portugal, that's a lot. That's about 10% of the population. 
demanding the, the country to enact this sort of uh, protocol of emergency, close everything, do not let people go into the, to the streets, close the gymnasiums, close everything. So people, it's, it's interesting because people are, are looking into, uh, to the government to provide them uh, control again. Because in a state of pandemic, we, we realize that we have lost control or we never had it from, from the start. And they're looking to the government to reestablish that trust. The problem, and this is one of the discussions right now, is it if the, the state of the emergency will not uh, solve this, this problem and what happens if uh, uh, governments lose the trust of the public? Because this is a very, this is the top thing that they can do is the state of emergency, close everything, put the, the, the police on the streets. If this fails, what happens? Is it revolt? Uh, do people lose confidence in the democratic procedure? That's one of the discussions right now, and it has some merit because it, it can happen because a pandemic is a, a, a very big deal. Yeah, it certainly can. So anyway, but backtracking in in the quest in, in our questions, so where would you place the direct threat of coronavirus on the list of threats against our civilization? Is is the coronavirus the number one threat to our civilization right now is it at the bottom of the list is it somewhere in the middle on the immediate scene it probably is but um we we shouldn't forget that this is about multiple interdependent failures acting all the time and this is not this is something that is not uh, unfamiliar to to the audience of collapse chronicles we don't have just pandemics to worry about. The, the growth of the human population hasn't stopped, and it, it's not going to stop because of this pandemic. Uh, climate change is still going forward. Uh, we still have the loss of biodiversity and the loss of ecosystem services. So it's a lot of failure, uh, multiple failures that are still in the, in the, in the backdrop and the background. Then we, are, we have to deal with that, even if we have to focus on, on the pandemic right now. Uh, because it, it has a lot of a lot of problems for our civilization, but also for what can happen if we we panic, for example. Well, well, we've certainly panicked. I mean, the entire yeah. the entire planet is in is in panic right now. Okay, so I, I'm I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one, uh, but anyway, I'm going to ask it anyway. So, do you consider the direct threat? to human health, you know, directly from the virus, or is it the knock-on effects to the global economy to be the biggest threat to civilization from something yes, like Yes, of it? course. I think it's the, it's the latter one. It's the, it's the knock-on effect because people are, are changing their, their routines, economies are stalling, and a lot of uh, small companies, medium com companies are all closed. So we don't know what one can happen after that surplus of, of available resources runs out and if companies stop producing stuff. On the other hand, I also studied um, public health and I, I worked for a, ta uh, for a time in it. And I also take into account the, the mortality and the, the, the effects that this has on our system of uh, health because it's just it's uh, overburdened right now. and. We shouldn't dismiss that as well because it's not just about the people that are that are dying. It's all it's also about the 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 fear that the, the pandemic creates and, the, and how how the disease affects our mental health. People are at home. They are uh, avoiding contact with other people. They are not exercising as as regularly. Their problem their diets are changing. So there are a lot of knockout effects as well from the. The, the pandemic that we haven't established as yet. Yeah, so let's let's talk about this public reaction now. So what? I, I, I can't see I can't see what you're dealing with, but here in Texas, I mean, it, it looks to me like the opening stages of Mad Max. I mean, how are the grocery store shelves and is there a bunch of panic buying and hoarding and all of that going on in Portugal just like there is in Texas? I, th I think that that went uh, uh, globally as well, uh, the panic buying of the, the toilet paper, but that was mostly a, a, mimetic, a mimetic thing. 
I think that we just captured it from the, the Australians and the, <laughs> from the people in the United States as well. And we just started replicating the same thing because you guys were doing it, those guys were doing it, and everyone started thinking, they must be onto something, so we're going to do it as well. But on the overall, I think people have been uh, very civilized. We, when I go shopping, I see people maintaining uh, social distancing and just keeping like two meters from each other and uh, very civilized and ordered. And uh, I haven't encountered any type of panic uh, during buying. We have like a, um, uh, it's not a law, but it's a, a rule that only 40 people enter the supermarket at a time. So we have uh, like queues outside, but it's people are trying to avoid these these mass gatherings in in general and just go in hours that people not a lot of people go there. Yeah, I have enjoyed the irony of the people queuing up. It's 20 people here in uh, Austin, Texas, but there might be a hundred people in the line, and I don't see a 600 foot line. I, you know what I'm saying? People are. The people are a hell of a lot closer than any six feet waiting to you see what I mean with the with the irony of all that uh, but what what you do see going on with this level of threat and, and what I am what I've been carrying away from this since day one I just want to see if you agree with my impression is that this I think this is an excellent snapshot into our future uh, of where we're going to go as more and more coronaviruses and, and things a lot worse uh, start rolling in and more and more people figure out the true level of threat that this economy and this entire civilization are in. Do you do you think that the that, that this is a snapshot into our future? Yes, of course. I, I started seeing this actually with uh, the Black Fridays that we, we regularly see each year. On that day, just people panicking and buy, ordering in, uh, in those supermarkets. And if people do that over TVs and uh, Playstations, what are they going to do when they run out of food and water? And uh, people are trying to uh, just keep, support their family. And if they're doing this for toilet paper and other non-essentials right now, like uh, other stuff for hygiene and like that, uh, it's like you say, if when they realize the, if they manage to realize, because if this, if this was a, sh a snapshot into the future, people will just continue to be complacent until the, the last hour, the, the last minute, and uh, the threat is all upon us. Yeah, well, they, 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 you know, well, there's different levels uh, that, that, that are going to form. Uh, you know, then when does it get to the point that people are, are, are going to start defending their own territories? What's going on, in, especially in Texas, probably leading the pack is gun sales. Gun sales and ammo sales going through the roof. Uh, over here, at least in the U.S., where you can just go into a, a store. I, I could go in to a store right now and buy an, and I guess buy an AR-15 right yeah. here in Austin, Texas. Uh, and I wouldn't, and I guarantee you, I would be waiting in a long line to do it. Yeah, you're at the epicenter of that. Uh, fortunately, we don't. I don't think we have that here in Portugal. So, but we see those news about the, the panic buying of guns in the, in the United States here. Yeah, it, it, it's, getting, it, it's getting pretty weird. It's, is it safe to say that uh, you see bigger threats coming down the pipe? You're 30 years old, I'm 60. By the time you're my age in the year 2050, how many, how many more coronaviruses and, and worse are you going to see by the time you're my age? Uh, I'm writing something about the coronavirus and the population right now uh, to be published soon, but I think that this is, of course, uh, there is an evident link here. The population density and uh, the, the practice of a society and people going into, into uh, forest areas uh, to urbanize and just get materials and uh, get get uh, the bush meat there's always a connection here so more people more need to be fed 
if this starts in let's say Congo or, or China with their with their wildlife markets, we can be sure that this will continue to, to, to spread worldwide. Because if we if we after this uh, after this pandemic uh, go back into the, the status quo of the globalized economy and uh, we are di we are certainly going to feel this thing again. And if we don't take this chance to, to learn something from it and just try to reset the system, it's, it will be a very big wasted opportunity. And so what is your level of optimism that uh, enough of humanity is going to learn that lesson from this episode or is it going right back to business as usual as we just learn to roll coronavirus in, into everything else we have to worry about? Well, I'm in the pessimistic team, I'm afraid, but uh, I'm, I'm talking with, with friends and colleagues and seeing what are their uh, what are they thinking about the future? And what I'm seeing is that they are already planning vacations into a, a time when they expect not to have uh, <laughs> coronavirus around. So it's all back to the start. I, I see these discussions in uh, in Facebook groups like uh, in population and ecology and systems thinking, people talking about how to, to restart the system, but the general public are not interested in that. They just want their lives back. And uh, if we are, fooling ourselves that we will reach an utopia after this and everything will change and we'll follow into the, the climate agreements. We're just fooling ourselves. Yes, sir. Okay, and my final question is, uh, since uh, this might be one time we can uh, end on an optimistic note, is there anything good coming out of the coronavirus if, if you were not a human from a non-humanist perspective uh, how is the rest of the planet and our fellow Earthlings uh, looking at this story? Um, yeah, this is the only silver lining so uh, so far. Uh, of course, if human activity is diminishing, we can be we can we begin to see uh, wildlife uh, booming again. This is like a bonanza for for the the natural world. We have we have seen dolphins and. Uh, other other mammalians in uh, in Venezia again in the in, in the in the streams there there are coming reports about about less uh, human activity like people jogging and uh, uh, wildlife feeling more at ease uh, going back into their routines because there there's something called the landscape of fear which is the in ecology that uh, wildlife uh, try to avoid places where it's dangerous to go and this disrupts their their natural cycles and uh, their reproductive cycles and if there's one thing positive in all of this is, is if there's less ships around if there's less people running around and less traffic we can be sure that animals will try to go back to those to those uh, places that are now mostly empty and they can regain some type of normalcy that uh, that they've lost in the in the last few decades or more Yep, I, I was reading that today about the dolphins uh, showing up in the canals of Venice for the first time and good lord for how, how long. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, just get, get humans out of the way and it's pretty amazing. I, I, I'm sure it's just a mirage, but I feel like the bird song is louder uh, right, right here. <laughs> Uh, right, right here where I'm living in Garfield, Texas, I feel like there, there's more bird song than I've ever heard out here. Uh, so anyway, let, let the birds sing on. But Joel Abigail, we really, really appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, your thoughts with us on the Coronavirus Chronicles. And we certainly appreciate the work uh, that you have done and keep up the, the lonely good fight for the next 30 years. I think you're going to become one of, the, one of the leading voices. You are certainly making uh, a, a, a stand for the planet. Uh, and we do appreciate it and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. Bye, guys.